Greetings and welcome to Mental Health Trailblazer, Psychiatric Nurses Speak Up. As we continue this journey to explore the 50-year legacy of the MFP, today we have with us doctoral fellow Alice Dressler, who will be giving us a perspective from the new generation of Minority Fellowship Program fellows. Alice, welcome to Mental Health Trailblazers. Hi, thank you for having me. You are most welcome, Alice. And let me start by asking you to share your journey to the world of behavioral health and nursing as a way of introduction for our audience. Thank you again so much for having me today. So a bit about myself, I came to the U.S. as an immigrant from China in 2017. And as a new immigrant back then, even though I had a degree from China, it was challenging for me to kind of like pick up my career, my prior profession. So I decided to go back to school. And when I was thinking about what my true passion is, healthcare was the answer and there was nothing else. Because as I was growing up, I had a lot of challenges uh, as a little girl in the big family because I was born in the 1980s in China. During that time, it was the one child policy in China. So boys were much preferred over girls. Unfortunately, that was the culture that also led to to a lot of girls were abandoned or put into other homes, separated from their family. And I was one of those. I was abandoned as an infant. And then my parents, they found me and they adopted me when I was uh, just a couple weeks old. They already have two older boys at the time. So then I became the new member of the family. So growing up, I always know the truth of my background and my birth history. And then I always have this feelings about how to help people have the passions like in the future I want to be able to help people and the healthcare system in China was it's very different it has been very different from the western world especially in the U.S. as I was growing up a lot of family members were in the healthcare system as doctors and nurses and I heard a lot of stories about how people were suffering they were dying in the hospital or right in front of the hospital due to the lack of financial support since there is no safety net in China when people really run out of options for their savings, their own insurance coverage. They have to resort to either borrow money from families or friends or they will have to kind of like forgo any treatment Uh, that they can't really afford. So as a result, when I was looking into a degree to college, I, even though I love healthcare, I love the science of medicine, I did not pursue it back then. And because of, I could not imagine the headache of working in that system and seeing people really suffer or die because of they didn't have the financial means. So when I came here, I really wanted to pick up my true passions to go into healthcare. And that's the time that I wanted to become a nurse. So I started going back to school as a nursing student in 2018. And I finished the Accelerated Bachelor of Science in Nursing program in December 2020 and started working as a cardiac ICU nurse in the local hospital. And a year in, uh, as you all remember, 2021, there was the year of pandemic. I really saw a lot of people struggle, not only the patients, the families, as well as a lot of our own uh, colleagues, the nurses, providers. It was so heartbreaking to see how much and people suffer in mental health. That's why I found a true passion in mental health within the nursing world. So here I am, you know, I have been attending University of Colorado Psychiatric Mental Health BSN to DMP program since, um, let me think, it's happening so long now, (laughs) 2022, (laughs) yes. So I'm still on the track. I will complete my master's degree this year in just um, four more months, and then I will continue on to attain my doctoral degree. Well, good luck on that journey. Thank you for sharing that, Alice. I'm curious, what was your previous profession? I was a civil engineer. Fascinating background, Alice. You had the chance to do a fresh start, and you wanted to go into healthcare. Why did you pick nursing? I love the science of medicine, 
And it was not very realistic for me to go the route to medical school because at the times I came, I was already 30 years old and I already have a, a baby with me. Uh, she was nine months old when I came. So I wanted to be able to pursue the science of medicine and serve in the healthcare realm as well as do it in a relatively realistic time frame. And nursing also really popped out to me because when I first came, I did not have health insurance for the first couple months as a new immigrant. So I had Medicaid as my insurance. After I was pregnant with my second child, I think about the third month in uh, the, in the new country. So to be able to receive the unconditional health care services as a new immigrant, I really appreciated, you know, everybody that provided care to me, especially the nurses. They were very caring. They really was listening to all the questions that I had at the time as a new immigrant, because trying to navigate the healthcare system as a new mom as well in the country. And I particularly remember a few nurses in my OBGYN office that were like super considerate and super supportive. And I am sure that they were also one of the reasons that sparked my interest in pursuing in nursing. And now that you've been working as a nurse, you've gone through nursing school, you're continuing uh, to pursue nursing to new heights. When you think back at your decision and the way that you were making that decision to go into nursing rather than medical school, do you think that you were correct? I'm pretty sure that it is the right choice for me. It's not necessarily like the easier route. And I think I just embrace the humanistic aspect uh, of the nursing realm because I feel like nurses see patients in a very holistic perspective. And we not only attend to their physical needs, mental health needs, as well as we consider a lot of their backgrounds, histories, and life experiences. And I feel like nurses especially have really been working with the patients at the front line most of the time versus providers. They're great for making treatment plans as well as really making diagnostic uh, results for the patients. And they don't get to spend as much time with the patients in person or virtually as much as the nurses. And I think that is the part that really draw me as well. I love the human connections. I love to be able to talk to my patients. And I think that's also why, even though I had a medical nursing background that I transitioned into mental health currently, is because I would like to actually talk to the patient. I would like to spend more time with the patient. So I think... For me, it's definitely the correct path, and I'm very grateful that I have been on this journey. During the Intensive Training Institute, the panel discussion that you were on with uh, other doctoral fellows, you mentioned that you were particularly drawn to the situation of women and children from underserved communities. What is it about the situation of women and children in your community that has drawn you to serve them better? My particular interest in women and children from underserved communities stem from many different experiences that I have had. As I mentioned earlier, I was adopted as the unpreferred girl back then. And my adopted parents, they did not have a lot of money. They were much older than a lot of my peers' parents because they were born in the 50s. Uh, so they, did, they didn't really have the opportunity to receive higher education. So they worked really hard to provide for the family. And they just didn't really have a lot of financial means at the same time. So I grew up in the rural communities and having that own lived experience that for that background, as well as when... I was in, still in China. I volunteer in an international uh, NGO that was from England that I work with uh, populations, with women especially, that were either was victims of human trafficking or they were victims of crimes and 
or like scams to get into the industry of providing sexual services to men. And I was working with the volunteers, uh, providing educations to those women in particular, and really promote their health as well as provide you know additional resources available from the local government as well as from the international resource for them. With those two prior experiences that I have always developed that interest of continue to provide services for women especially. And after I became a nurse, I also work in the public health, local public health department as well. And I work, I serve many low or no income women who are racial and ethnic minority with young children at home. And in order to kind of reduce these women's health disparities and improve their uh, overall healthcare outcomes, including physical and behavioral health, as well as providing support for the young children, it is really important for us to address all these factors contributing to their disparities in health. So over the past two and a half years, I've worked uh, in the health department, working with these women and children, and also working with the Child Protective Service as well, that... I feel like I have found my true passion in uh, in nursing in my career that is moving forward. I would like to continue to provide care services as well as a future research topic on these populations, especially from underserved communities. And specifically, what area are you in? Is it a rural community, urban? If you could describe that. At the moment, so... I serve in a local city that is about 30 minutes from Denver in Colorado. Maybe about 10, 20% of the population that I serve, they live in the rural area. And the remains, they kind of live within the county, but doesn't really technically count as the rural area. Almost like 95% of the population that I serve, they have either no income or very low income. And a majority of them, probably above 80% of them, um, are from different minority backgrounds. Majority Hispanic as well as African American. A lot of the families that I serve, they have very limited support system. And most of them also have a very significant trauma history, uh, have a lot of adverse childhood experiences. So, yeah, all of the Factors above make them really vulnerable. In this line of work, when you're talking about addressing health inequities, uh, health disparities, you hear a lot about the importance of making sure that the service providers at least are trained in culturally appropriate interventions. When the patients feel comfortable with their service provider, when they can see themselves reflected, then it makes for better health outcomes. How has your experience been working with communities that are not necessarily your own, you know, in, in, in that sense? And how have you been able to to build that rapport? And, and has that been an issue for you? That's a really great topic. Every person has very unique experience of themselves. We live in a society that we are exposed to all different values and beliefs and unfortunately racism as well. So in my own experience working with family from diverse backgrounds that I do find it extremely helpful for patients and clients to be able to connect with people from similar backgrounds or similar beliefs or similar life experience that who may also have experienced racism or they have immigrated into the country or if their parents or grandparents was the first generation of immigrants, things like that. I have found patients or families have being able to connect with the providers, nurses, uh, or other professionals within the healthcare systems a bit more 
compared to maybe from the majority the populations like um, where we serve is white. A lot of the professions in the healthcare system, maybe more than half of them are white. And then I have found patients are really able to relate a bit more and be a bit more forthcoming in their own experience. A lot of times when doing my clinicals as a psych MP student that I have found some of my patients are more willing to disclose their trauma history to a providers or to a staff that has similar backgrounds or similar beliefs or culture. When the person is not of a similar background or culture, how do you approach that relationship? Or what are the approaches that uh, people should um, consider? What works in terms of breaking down the barriers that might exist as you begin your relationship uh, with a patient or with a client? What are, the, what are the steps that you take to build that trust? I think as nurses, one of the greatest thing is we are all naturally caring and naturally want to understand one another and respect one another. So I think that just comes with within the profession already. Otherwise, nurses or nurse practitioners would not have chosen this career path. So I think that is the biggest advantage to us to be able to really understand a patient from different backgrounds. And a lot of times I have learned that it has been helpful to be able to really shine some light on the topic during our interactions with the families and the patients is even though we may have come from different backgrounds or ethnicity, we are able to ask simple questions such as like, how have your experience been like living in Colorado as uh, someone from China or from India, it doesn't really take a whole lot of time. And I know in healthcare, time is uh, always the essence. And just a few simple questions, try to be more curious about the patients and the families, their life experience, as well as their current you know, presentations. And a lot of times, patients and family find it that was a really great opportunity to open up, to kind of like connect. And a lot of them are more than willing to share. And I think that's the beauty in this profession. From your experience, what changes would you recommend from what you've seen in the way that mental health care is being delivered that would improve outcomes for these underserved communities? I have been very grateful to witness that over the past few years in my own experience as a psychiatric nurse practitioner student, I have received a lot of trainings in cultural awareness, trauma-informed care, and I think the system, it is improving. And to be able to have more education on uh, all the staff, all the professionals, within the system, as well as we take the time to self-reflect in our own experience, in our own bias, because everybody has biases, either like consciously or subconsciously. And to be able to understand ourselves better, it is really a first step to be able to understand our patients better. And we kind of like build on that. So I think from personal lenses is take the time to be able to reflect on our experience, perhaps even traumas, adverse childhood experience and biases, as well as help others to understand, have that open discussions with one another. And from a systemic level is leaders in the systems, as well as the policy makers, they have more opportunity to learn about the importance of providing cultural appropriate care as well as trauma-informed care. I think if that set the tone for the healthcare system, it does make a huge difference in the services down the stream.
Moving now to your experience with the Minority Fellowship Program, we are celebrating 50 years of this program. From what you've experienced so far, what would you say the legacy or the impact of it has been? Yes, for sure. Uh, So during the last intensive just a few weeks ago at the D.C., my personal experiences is the program provided such and invaluable experience for all the fellows to connect and to reflect on our own journey in mental health world. I think that is the most valuable experience that I have had in my nursing career because, you know, everyone has a very unique story and they all have very different backgrounds from different countries and to be able to really hear and learn from one another and connect with one another, to be inspired by everyone, then I think it's really helping fellows to kind of continue the work they have been doing and to continue to be amazing and continue to serve on the populations that you know, we are inspired to serve. I think that is really beautiful for the program because I, from what I have heard during the intensive is all the fellows are really inspired to continue to serve in, you know, uh, different minority populations. And I think that is kind of spirit of the MFP to be able to bridge that gap and to reduce the disparity in mental health for the minority populations. This sense of community or being together with many others who think like you or who have similar interests and values, how important was that for you? It is extremely important because I have lacked that experience so far. As I mentioned earlier, I went back to school in 2018 to take the prerequisites in nursing and then went on to continue uh, to finish my program at the Regent University in Colorado. And I worked for a year and then went back to school. And during this whole time, what I have noticed that definitely in the nursing students, nursing students and nurse practitioner students, The majority of them are still white, and there were far in between a few of us from different minority backgrounds. So to be able to have these opportunities at the intensive to bond with one another and to understand one another even without really knowing each other prior, that was amazing because it kind of like really gave us a sense of belonging and uh, validated our own lived experience as well. And when you think about your own career and your own trajectory in this work, how has that experience transformed or energized what you see for yourself? Yeah, for sure. It has energized me a lot because I was always joking um, prior to attending the intensive that I'm going to be done with school come December this year. I will finish my master's degree and then I'll be done because I have been in school nonstop since I moved to this country at the time raising two young children. And being in the intensive, hearing all the experts and the alumni to share their experience, their achievements and their inspirations I have learned so much from each one of them, as well as inspired by all of them and the current fellows. There is so much work they have been doing, and they have so much passion to provide care for the underserved communities. And for me, it really lit the fire within me, as well as to think a lot more bother about what I could achieve in general. It is great to be a psychiatric nurse practitioner providing direct patient service. And I have also been inspired to consider future like research project and to tailor services to a broader populations as well as community because of that.
I think my goal for myself in the first three years would be to provide more direct clinical services to patients and families. The longer term goals, one of them is that I would like definitely to continue my doctoral degree and to conduct research how to improve the current practice, especially the services for uh, women and children in the rural communities from minority backgrounds. In the long term, I I do have an interest to move into more of the policy making process to not necessarily I would want to work for the government. And I think it's important to advocate for the profession as well as for the patients that we serve. And to be able to do that, that really takes additional effort and time to involve in different committees and in associations. So I think that is also one of my goal to be able to keep myself current at the practice as well as hopefully make more positive changes uh, at the systematic level. I want us to explore a little bit more about your experiences as an Asian American uh, in in this field, being a first generation immigrant from China, um, how has that impacted your experience with nursing school? I think that is very true with a lot of the fellows that I have met during intensive. Like a lot of us are the only one, like the only Asian student or the only immigrant in the cohort, and I think for myself is. It definitely, you know, obviously provided me a lot of opportunity to reflect on maybe the differences that how I view the material was taught as well as how I view my personal working relationship with my patients and also reflect on my own experience maybe on the other end receiving different biases because I'm speaking about that as during the pandemic, right? There's a certain population that really contributed the cause or the damage that was done because of uh, China. And as someone that is from the country, I definitely felt that there was a lot of negativity towards Asian population, especially Chinese populations in my own community. So... How did that make you feel? That was the first time in my life that I didn't feel safe as I'm not doing anything, that I'm I'm not feeling safe because how I look or how I speak. I would definitely identify as a trauma um, because of, you know, news were everywhere about how people were killing or hating immigrants or workers from China, uh, from different countries. It was not an easy year for sure. And as a first generation immigrants that, especially with all my families are still in China or live in Hong Kong, that I don't really have a lot of close people to be able to relate that experience to. I think that was a bit isolating for sure. And also helped me really understand people from other ethnicities as well, because of even though they might have been born and raised here, however, a lot of them, especially African-American patients that I have served, they have experienced different levels of racism their whole life. And it really helped me to be able to understand them a lot better and to be able to be more open during my communication with my patients. And I think that has been very helpful. I can definitely see how experiencing something like that gives you the empathy. If you haven't experienced racism, then it's hard to understand how it impacts somebody's mental health, how it impacts their way of thinking and their sense of safety, as you said, and how that can cascade into other parts of your life. And um, 
how it affects your overall well-being. I'm sorry that you had to go through that. What were your thoughts of America before you came? And then when this happened, was it a surprise for you? Yes, it was surprising, to be honest. Even though I was growing up my whole childhood and early adulthood in China with limited information from TV news or online material within uh, the mainland of the country, though I have the fortune that to be able to make friends from different countries. So I have always kind of have a more open mind towards the United States at the time. I, di I didn't really have a whole, like, a particular thought about the country. I just imagine it has more freedom, for sure. And then when I myself experienced, I think I was pretty naive coming into a new country uh, just because I received higher education in China and I have a respected career back home. So I never really experienced much disparities in my adulthood. And so to experience that hatred that lasted for like almost two years, it was pretty shocking. And uh, due to the political dynamic at the time that I felt, it seems like, you know, the country where I was in, things were really polarized and definitely more hesitations about where I want to raise my children, where I want them to go to school, a lot of more personal thoughts when it comes to that after the, my own experience. Yeah, I hear you there. Are there lessons that American healthcare behavioral mental health care and nursing in particular can learn from both Chinese models or approaches or non-Western approaches in general from, from your experience. What can Western medicine, Western mental health care learn from Chinese mental health care, if there's such a thing? Since I didn't really have personal experience or working experience in the mental health care field in China, it's kind of difficult for me to particularly say what we can learn from the Chinese model. In my own interest that I have explored, you know, different practices, you know, um, from different countries in the global uh, stage that I do love kind of like the more holistic approach that a lot of times we do emphasize family support in the United States and we do emphasize, you know, physical health and the mental health together. And due to the family structure here, you know, it's quite a bit different from maybe Asian family structures. I feel like a lot of families that I have served in America that similarly compared to those countries, a little bit smaller. So, and we, as we all say, right, like it takes a village to raise a child and those children growing into adult. So I feel like human connections and support system it is one of the most important approaches that I could think of. That means to really help our patients or our families that we work with to identify, you know, their social support system, to help them to build that connections, to expand on their interactions with one another, either if through, you know, their own big family system or to connect with other people within the local community via different venues, such as like organizations, charities, churches, and associations, online platform. I think that is really important for us to, a really meaningful way for us to help improve our approach as in providing mental health care. And... I do love the system that England has been implementing. Some areas in England is um, actually, it's one of my passion too, is the gardening. Uh, I have watched a few shows uh, that they talk about how the local communities or charities, they kind of like carve the space and build community green space for people to offer to people uh, what mental health need to go regularly to, you know, garden vegetable, fruits, uh, plant flowers, 
and it has been quite successful over the past few years. I think that is also one of my dreams. One day, hopefully, I can implement that approach here to provide, you know, more naturalistic healing environments for the patients and the family. Yeah, the benefits of that are multi-pronged. You get the environmental therapy, if you will, from being around plants and in, in a horticultural space. And then there's also the connection with nutrition. So when we had our discussion at the ITI, at the end, you had this beautiful story about the impact of that whole experience. And you used uh, these visual references about light and the tunnel and, and then the sky. That was really beautiful. For me, as an immigrant in the country, I felt like I have been navigating, you know, life, career, school in the United States for so long, since 2017. And I think prior to attending the ITI in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, I have been in my master uh, program for just two years, and I just felt like I was losing my sparks. I was losing my energy. Um, I felt like, you know, I have to go through all the nursing prerequisites and then have to get a second bachelor degree and then has to work for a year and then went back to school. I just felt like it has been so much. And on top of navigating the pandemic, navigating the racism that I experienced for the first time in my life and the fear for my own safety and my family's safety. And also my father passed away during pandemic at the time as well. So I think I was really losing my energy and losing my sparks. And to be able to sh connect with one another, especially with people that are from minority backgrounds, that brought me so much joy and so much inspirations that I felt like, you know, people say like, oh, keep going. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. They say, I only have five more months left and then you can graduate from your master degree, then you can practice. And I felt like that light was definitely dimming. And sometimes I couldn't even see any light anymore. And each fellows that I have met and, you know, uh, have the fortunate to hear and learn from their own personal experience at the ITI, they were all like individual star for me, that lighting in the sky. So I felt like it was all darkness before I headed to the ITI. And once I have connected with the fellows and the alumni and the professors, that I felt like my sky was literally lit with all the stars again. And I felt like now I don't have to worry about that light at the end of the tunnel because I was worried that it would go out or it had gone out. And now with the constant star shining in the sky, they will always be there. Even though the days will come, I may not see the light. And then when they come back to nighttime again, they will be always there shining. So I felt so inspired and I, I have this desire to continue to really lock myself to that memory and to continue to promote my self-growth and to better service, you know, but better provide service to the patients that I have been inspired all the way. What did your family say when you came back? When I came back... Um, when you came back from the intensive training institute. Intensive. Yeah. Uh, it was funny because of, they were like, I thought you said you were going to be done in four months. Like, um, So now when they ask me about my plan, I always tell them like, you know what? Like, actually, I think I am energized again. I think I can do this and I want to do more. So they find it funny. And also they are really grateful for it as well because they could have seen you know they have seen the changes in my approaches to my schoolwork assignments rather than just like dreading about oh one more okay get it done and I just want to get it done and now they see me like enjoying it again having more fun 
in this journey again. So I think、um, they're definitely very grateful for me to have had the opportunity to have that. Thank you very much, Alice. That is wonderful to hear. And that does it for this episode of Mental Health Trailblazers Psychiatric Nurses Speak Up. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion and I look forward to you joining us on future episodes. This is the Minority Fellowship Program at the American Nurses Association podcast, featuring nurse scientists addressing the psychiatric and mental health issues affecting underrepresented communities across America. You can always find us online at emfp.org and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. The views expressed by the speakers and host do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government.